Okay, hello and good afternoon and um, good evening to our colleagues who are joining us on the East Coast. Um, I know we still have some folks who are joining us actively as well. And so um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for attending today's webinar, Sounding the Alarm, addressing the declining representation of Black students in California's community college. I'm Frank Harris III, and I have the pleasure of serving as a professor of post-secondary education and co-director of the Community College Equity Assessment Lab at San Diego State University. Next slide. Before we begin, I would like to offer this land acknowledgement um, to let you know that I'm joining you from occupied Kumeyaay land. Um, this is in the San Diego region of Southern California. And of course, Kumeyaay land is a land that has protected us, healed us, nourished us, and has inspired us for generations and continues to do so. Next slide. We all know that nothing is accomplished without collaboration and coordination of like-minded colleagues and organizations. In that vein, I would like to um, thank and acknowledge the organizations that have agreed to co-sponsor today's webinar, uh, the RP Group, the Community College Equity Assessment Lab, the Equity Avengers, the Center for Organizational Responsibility and Advancement, and the African American Male Education Network and Development. Uh, want to thank the colleagues who are affiliated with these organizations uh, for their sponsorship and their support. Next slide. Today's webinar will be somewhat of a departure from webinars we've done in the past. Today's session has been intentionally designed to bring together some of the most prominent thought institutional and policy leaders in one forum to address an urgent concern that began at least a decade ago and that has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, that being the declining representation of Black students in our community colleges. While our focus will be on the California context, I can comfortably assert that all of what we were discussing uh, with regard to policies and implications and issues and challenges have broader implications beyond California. Next slide. We will begin with opening remarks from Acting Chancellor Dr. Daisy Gonzalez. Immediately following Dr. Gonzalez's remarks, I will offer some framing com commentary that helps to establish the setting and context of today's webinar. Next slide. Immediately following will be a research and data presentation from Drs. Valerie London Wagner, Interim Vice Chancellor of Digital Innovation and Infrastructure in California's Community Colleges, and Dr. Darla Cooper, Executive Director of the RP Group. Next slide. After we've had the opportunity to learn from the insights that will be shared by Drs. Lundy, Wagner, and Cooper, we will observe two facilitated discussion with the, discussions with the panel of experts. These discussions will be moderated by Dr. Keith Curry, President and CEO of Compton College, and Dr. Pamela Luster, President of San Diego Mesa College. Next slide. Our first panel will focus on leveraging state, national, and institutional policy and will be moderated by Dr. Curry. Serving as the experts on this panel are Drs. Michelle Asha Cooper, Acting Assistant Secretary in the Office of Post-Secondary Education and Deputy Assistant Secretary for the U.S. Department of Education. We also have Dr. J. Luke Wood, who's Vice President for Student Affairs at Campus Diversity at San Diego State University, where he also serves as co-director of the Community College Equity Assessment Lab and holds the position of Chief Diversity Officer. And of course, we have Dr. Sean Harper, the Provost Professor of Education and Business and the founding Executive Director of the Race and Equity Center at the University of Southern California. Next slide. The second panel will be moderated by Dr. Pamela Luster and will offer insights on how institutional resources and initiatives can be leveraged to address the declining representation of Black students. The experts on this panel will be Dr. Tina King, Assistant Superintendent and Vice President for Student Affairs at Southwestern College, Dr. Erica Indri Jonas, President of Pasadena City College, and Dr. Edward Bush, President of Consumnus River College. 
Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to use the Q&A function or the chat to post questions, thoughts, and reactions that come to mind throughout our discussion. Uh, time permitting, we will invite our speakers to respond to the questions that are posed in the chat. Um, now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Daisy Gonzalez. Next slide. Dr. Daisy Gonzalez is the acting chancellor for California's community colleges. Dr. Gonzalez is responsible for setting policy and guidance for 73 districts and 115 community colleges. She coordinates the divisions of academic affairs, student services and special programs, economic development and workforce preparation and the institutional effectiveness partnership initiative. She's also responsible for tracking and implementing the vision for success the system's comprehensive plan to improve student outcomes at California's 115 community colleges. Dr. Gonzalez began her career as a dual immersion third grade teacher and left the classroom for a career in fiscal policy and legislation. She served as a principal budget consultant to the California State Assembly, where she managed $11.2 billion in state funds and prior to joining the chancellor's office, Dr. Gonzalez was the principal consultant for the Assembly Appropriations Committee, where she was responsible for subject matter expertise, analysis, and political strategy in the areas of higher education, K-12 education, and jobs and economic development. Dr. Gonzalez serves as a commissioner of the Accrediting Commission for California, excuse me, for community and junior colleges, and is the co-founder of the Sacramento Latino Leaders network. She earned her bachelor's degree in public policy from Mills College and a master's and PhD degrees in sociology from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Daisy Gonzalez. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Good afternoon now, everyone. And uh, it is an honor to be here with all of you, especially with this incredible lineup. I will be brief. I am honored to welcome you to be sounding the alarm addressing the declining representation of Black students in California community colleges. And this topic is even more important given everything that is happening in our state, but more importantly, the population that we are discussing today. I want to thank you specifically and share gratitude to our hosts, Dr. Wood, Dr. Harris, Dr. Harper, Dr. Curry, and so many others who will be speaking to you today. I also want to make sure that I acknowledge and thank our Vice Chancellor, Dr. Valerie Lundy Wagner, who you will hear from later on today. On behalf of the Chancellor's Office and the Board of Governors, I want to use this time to be straightforward and just get to the point. Ensuring Black student success calls on us to love Black students, to protect Black students, and more importantly, to take action. Over the last four years, our system has been undergoing a transformation. Strategies such as guided pathways, equitable placement, new funding models, teaching and learning innovations such as credit for prior learning, competency-based education. Those are all tools, tools to design an institution and the institutions that we currently serve to be student-centered. But if we want Black students to succeed, we can't divorce these tools and these strategies from the society that we live in and the real work that needs to simultaneously take place. Education systems, and that means all of you here today, but education systems and institutions play an important role and certainly have a responsibility in addressing and eliminating racism. Today's event is a reminder of our collective work our work across segments and fields, and our work to dismantle a culture of hate, violence, inequality, and complacency. Our work and what we need to do is too important. We need to get to systems of power and those that control the resources that our students need. So my hope for the rest of this event is that you emerge from these, this time together as stronger partners, to be bold leaders, to be strategic system thinkers and to be unapologetic on behalf of Black student success. So thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting us to be a part of this journey with you. And more importantly, for being partners in making sure that the vision for success is a reality for African-American students and our Black students. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Gonzalez, for your thoughtful remarks, and more importantly, for your equity-minded leadership in one of the, the one of the country's um, largest system of higher education. So we thank you, we appreciate you, and your commitment to Black students and Black student success. Next slide. To provide some context for today's webinar, I would like to begin by noting that the declining representation of Black students in the California community colleges is by no means a new phenomenon. As evidenced by the data that are presented on the next slide, this is a trend that has been ongoing for nearly a decade, if not longer. As we can see, there were nearly 35,000, there are were, there are, were, excuse me, there were nearly 35,000 fewer Black students enrolled in the fall 2020 term than there were in the fall of 2014. Another important observation is that with the exception of the fall 2020 term, the term that immediately followed the pandemic, enrollment in the California community colleges has been consistent at approximately 1.5 million students. Yet still, the enrollment of Black students has steadily declined. Next slide. Of course, the events of the past 18 months has worsened this concern. We need to look no further than the disproportionate impact the pandemic has had on the Black community, be it in infection rates, death rates, and access to vaccines. There's also the tragic murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery, and far too many others that occurred last year, which resulted in global protests against systemic oppression and anti-Black racism, not to mention the 2020 presidential election and the insurrection that took place at the US Capitol, which was spewed by uh, the Trump campaign's hateful, racist, and divisive rhetoric, as well as unfounded claims of an election being stolen. Undoubtedly, these social movements and phenomenon impacted college campus climates in very intense and transparent ways. In response to some of these events, on June 5th, 2020, then Chancellor Eloy Oakley issued a call to action, urging educators across sectors and systems to actively strategize and take action against structural racism. Included in the call were five key actions. One, a system-wide review of law enforcement officers and first responder training and curriculum. Two, host open dialogue and address campus climate. Three, create an action plan to create inclusive campus class, inclusive classrooms and anti-racist curriculum. Four, district board reviews and updates of equity plans with urgency. And five, to shorten the time frame for the full implementation of the diversity, equity, and inclusion integration plan. So in some ways, today's webinar is in part a response to Chancellor Oakley's call to action. That being said, we must also recognize that there are tensions and contradictions in this conversation. The state has been more invested in equity than it ever has been before and has directed substantial resources towards realizing it. Yet we have not seen the progress that any of us would hope and expect to see. While we can celebrate the fact that more students in the system are completing college level coursework, for example, as a result of these efforts, equity gaps on key indicators remain constant. Even as success rates have improved, equity gaps have not. Thus, we find ourselves wrestling with the obvious tension of needing to ask for more attention, more resources, and more support, while also acknowledging that much has been given. But one thing is certain, we cannot program our way out of this. It's going to take a radical reimagining of our systems, our institutions, our policies, our curricula, our support services, and everything that has that impacts the experiences and success of black students we cannot afford to wait we must do it now we have and we have what it takes to get it done so let's do it next slide with that context i would like to invite doctors valerie lundy wagner and dr darla cooper to guide us in a discussion and presentation of research and data regarding this phenomenon. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. 
Great. So um, my name is Valerie Lundy Wagner. I'm the interim vice chancellor for digital innovation and infrastructure for the California Community Colleges system. And I'm pleased to be here today. I am the child of someone who integrated their school. Um, I am the child, uh, the grandchild of someone who used to pick strawberries and cotton. Um, I understand or I feel like I, I, like many others, have an understanding of um, the road toward educational equity and how consequential and important it is. Um, and so I think it's important to talk about Black student enrollment and outcomes in our system. I think as the acting chancellor noted, um, we really need to think about how we understand the data um, in alignment with the systems that we are um, situated within. And so I hope to, yes, run you through a little bit of the data, but my hope is that folks will be asking questions here and outside of this webinar, um, because looking at the data alone is not sufficient. Understanding who or what is actually preventing the work that needs to happen, what rules, what systems, who controls them is very important. Um, when we think about um, folks, especially who are outside of the state of California, I know that you see potentially the dollar signs associated with allocations to our system and to our colleges. And it looks like a lot of money. And so I will challenge my colleagues from the system to really be thinking about how we can justify the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been invested when we see some of the outcomes that we do and what it would take if money is not the sole issue. I would challenge you to, is, is money the only issue that is at hand here? I would say it's the system. So I will run you through the data. We will then, I will end um, sharing a little bit about sort of how I conceptualize um, or think that it will be helpful for folks to really interrogate the data to really um, help us make significant strides around um, how the system is serving Black students, Black families, Black taxpayers in the state of California. Next slide, please. So first, I do want to sort of remind everyone, you know, the California Community Colleges system um, is a relatively decentralized system with 116 colleges. One is a fully online competency-based education um, sort of uh, set of programs that's relatively new. The rest are, you know, effectively 115 brick and mortar in this world of the Zooms with the pandemic. That said, they serve a variety of students. Um, I know we sort of mentioned the diversity of community colleges colleges, but I did want to just lay this out here so we can be very clear that when we're talking about community colleges, there is this sort of um, uh, inertia toward high school students, right? And that is one part of the population that enrolls in community colleges. That said, there are a number of other folks who do have a high school diploma, who may not have a high school diploma, who are not necessarily recently out of high school, who are seeking to enter our institutions and the reasons why they enroll yes maybe about a specific educational path it might just be about obtaining knowledge or skills and it might be definitively to collect um, or earn a credential all of which is relevant um, and I, I point this out because when i first started a couple uh, almost two years ago we were talking about black students and we were talking about campaigns um, to students and parents and I thought, this is a great thing. I said, has anyone looked at the average age of Black students in the California Community Colleges system? And it's 28. And so while it doesn't mean that we ignore students and parents, right, those younger students, it does mean we really need to pay attention to what it means to fully understand comprehensively, right? who Black students are that are attending the system. And then, of course, I would say the individual colleges and districts within our system. So please do keep that in mind as you're looking at some of the data that's being shared with you today in my presentation and with others, and who you're thinking of when you talk about um, enrollment declines um, and representation of Black students in this system. Next slide, please. So just to make sure I set a little context, you know, we are still in the throes of a global pandemic. You know, we've seen that there are enrollment declines across the board. Um, you know, I don't anticipate that fall 2021 is going to look, you know, 
significantly different. Um, that said, you can see that um, Black students and Native students, not surprisingly, continue to be some of the students um, most impacted by sort of what the pandemic has done. And we're seeing these like enrollment um, declines based on sort of previous years. Next slide, please. This is an important topic for California community colleges, um, and especially for this conversation, given what we see with Black student enrollment at the community college system. That said, just as I noted earlier, we need to understand the data in context. What we know is that after the Great Recession, up and through February 2020, the economy of this country and the state were on the rise. And what we know about trends for probably, I'd say, the last 50 years around community college students is that when the economy is high, enrollment in two-year institutions declines. Not to mention the fact that California is un has been part of at least a decades-long housing crisis, which has led to a number of larger and smaller cities um, seeing declines in um, Black populations, and that is not just from our sort of more urban centers necessarily to more suburban, but also out of the state. And so we need to pay attention to when we're looking at this sort of decline that we're taking into account the fact that most Black students, Black, Black families in our state, many of them are low income, right? And so they're going to be going to work and not necessarily enrolling in two-year institutions. And then we know that the state has experienced significant declines. Um, of the black population. So now does this mean that the California community college system has nothing to do around black student enrollment? Not at all. It does mean that we need to be very careful about sort of how we um, get excited about this topic and how we situate what the problem is so that we can really think clearly about what the solutions are. Next slide, please. So the next couple of slides I'm gonna show you, well, actually, let me say this. So here's another slide. It comes from my colleagues over at California Competes. I put this up here because, again, when you saw the previous slide with the decline, we're keeping the economy in mind. We're keeping the fact that Black folks are leaving the state of California. We also want to keep in mind this context that prior to the pandemic, there were plenty of people in the state of California who could have been attending California's community colleges. More than 6 million adults have some college, no degree. So even if we just ignore everyone who just came out of high school, 6 million adults, more than half of them are people of color. Some notable percentage of them are black and African-American. We have to ask ourselves, is the pandemic the problem for black and African-American student enrollment in this system? I think what we have here with this information is an opportunity to really interrogate what our past practices were around um, this work, to really pay attention to which populations we were addressing and which we weren't. So again, please keep this in mind as we continue. I will get to sort of the system level data and then um, wrap up. Next slide, please. Thanks. So I, I did want to note this, right? I often hear this conversation about enrollment management um, as though people are, you know, widgets, I think some people call it. I would like us to stop thinking about this about enrollment management, not to say that this is not higher education is not a business. Plenty of reasons to, to know that that's not it. But I think we need to think about how we're facilitating mobility among populations um, here with our system. Um, next slide, please. I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of a technical difficulty, but let me leave this here. Um, so multiple measures in AB 705 definitively improved ac access to transfer level coursework, which we know is consequential for outcomes. We see that we were making sort of trickles of progress between 2014 and the year before the pandemic. We see a notable jump the last couple of years. And so that's meaningful and important. Next slide, please.
I think it's also important to think about some of the work that happened in around the 2013-14s, the CCP P grants, we had $500 million investment by the state to support career education or career and technical education for those of you not familiar with sort of our language. And what you can see here, again, completion rates in terms of career education, relatively stagnant. Next slide, please. And see black retention rates are relatively stagnant. Um, and what's interesting is that we don't see a big drop off during the pandemic, which I think is kudos to our faculty and administrators in terms of helping students stay enrolled um, and continue being successful. It's notable because we, there's certainly an opportunity for us to learn more. Next slide, please. And when we look at course success rates, again, they're sort of relatively stagnant. We see, again, a, a little bit of a bump, but that really is sort of related to um, the pandemic and sort of how we ca calculate these rates. Next slide, please. Um, and finally, I wanted to make sure I noted, you know, students are coming to the California Community College system so that they can transfer. It's important to think about how, where and how they are transferring. Certainly important to think about that first column to the left public in-state institutions, right? This is the California state and um, university system and the University of California system. It's interesting when you look at this and when we see at the system level, despite some of the efforts around um, things like the associate degree for transfer, some of the UC transfer pathways, et cetera, we're not seeing a significant system level change. We're seeing sort of, uh, again, some of the similar outcomes in terms of the private in-states and also the private out-of-states, um, which, you know, this might include some of our work to partner with historically Black colleges. But again, overall, you can see we're, we're not seeing big system level changes. Next slide, please. And so... As I noted at the outset, what context affects significant improvements in system level outcomes for black students? And so I'm going to show you a couple of slides. I do have black in sort of parentheses because to some extent, I think that um, what we know in from things like uh, other industries, healthcare, for example, is when you are supporting um, folks who have the most need, you support everyone. Um, so I hope no one takes offense to this, um, but I just wanted to, to note that before we go forward. Next slide, please. So when I think of student experiences, right, how do I think about system level changes, not individuals, right? Because I'm, I'm confident that we have folks in our system uh, who are committed to individual students, right? Whether they are administrators or janitors or um, retention specialists, right? All of, the, all of these people I believe are doing the work. That said, it's important to, again, at the system level, what are some of the experiences? And so I have this on the left, admission and application, the onboarding, retention, classroom climate, campus climate. And then I have on the right, sort of what I would consider some different governance contexts. For those of you who are not familiar with how the chancellor's office is situated within this state for this system, alongside the CSU and the UC, I encourage you, encourage you to read on this type of work. Um, I have an old colleague, her name is Joni Finney, who's done a, a fantastic job sort of describing some of this. It, it can be a little lengthy, but it is important because the chancellor's office takes its direction from the board of governors and the legislature for a system of 116 colleges and 73 districts where there is district level oversight and governance around implementation. So when I look at where the chancellor's office can make big um, changes, those are really around the admission process. Parts of the beginning of that process are really at the system level, not necessarily at the individual colleges. The chancellor's office has a decent sort of connection to some of the onboarding processes, processes in terms of the technology that we offer and provide. That said, when I look at some of the day-to-day -day work around onboarding, when we understand retention strategies, who is designing them, classroom climate, these are places where it is important to 
be clear about what the system office does and what the community college and the district leadership are doing, are, are deciding what the administrative administration and staff are doing, I should say district and college, I, I think also like the presidents and the, their trustees, right? Administration and staff, right? Your, C, your vice presidents and chief student affairs officers, et cetera. And then of course we have our faculty, right? All of these four different contexts are critical to all of the work related to Black and African-American students' success. And so we need to be clear about how they all work together or don't. I think one of the hallmarks of you know, our nation is that we have built up systems that can be supportive. That said, when they don't work because they are interconnected in ways that are difficult, it can make conversations hard when we talk about why things don't work. Next slide, please. And so in my mind, my hope is that all of the work that's happening locally and in partnership with the system is really to help students have sort of a positive accumulation of advantages, right? Whether it's from the work that happens when they're connected to folks in outreach and retention, the folks who are doing communications, admissions and records, financial aid and basic needs, right? When the transfer centers come in, right? How do all of these things work together or not? And do they do so in ways that we know are demonstrably positive and additive to students' experiences. Demonstrably positive and additive to students' experiences and outcomes. And I put on here the note to the external partners, we really should be thinking about how all of these other partners fit in, right? The California Community College system is not in a vacuum. They have partners with CDE, right? We, we work on that with the vision for success, our commitments with the CSU and the UC. That said, I think as we go to the next slide, please, what's really important is that we think about how we are aligning resources and programs to put students first. Students first, not all the other people who are connected to this work. How do we put students first so that we can be clear when we're making decisions if we're actually helping or hurting them? At, again, for me, at the system level. Next slide, please. And so as folks go forward, as you have these conversations today, I think my colleagues, please be thinking about how do we use data and evidence to facilitate Black enrollment and success. I think we have seen, especially from our colleague, um, President Keith Curry, what does it mean to be a student-ready institution, the sort of language coming from he and others in our system. I think there's another space, I saw someone note it in the, in the chat around things like AB705. I think we need to make space for being wrong and for taking in new information. We see this with the vaccines and this pandemic, right? People thought things weren't away. The reality is we have hospitals that are full right now because people were taking, in wrong, taking information incorrectly. That is like a fact. And so if we have 25 years of data that placement is inequitable, then why are we continuing to do it when we know that it disproportionately harms students? We have the example from our colleagues across the country, notably historically Black colleges and universities, that students can have attended poorly resourced institutions and do quite well. And it didn't take them six to eight to 10 years. We can, we can do this. So we need to make space for being wrong about how we thought things worked or what might be best and go to the evidence and take in this new information. We got to establish these strategies based on data around equity gaps. Remember I mentioned this notion of like um, 28, uh, the average age of black students in our system, 28. It is important that colleges and districts in our system pay attention to that level of detail as they're thinking about their outreach and recruitment and retention strategies. Clarity on what the systems are that need to change based on our governance context. California community colleges, money is not the issue. What I'm interested in is wanting to know who is talking about why our system office that is supposed to be doing oversight for all of these, no one told anyone that we should have new staff. This is a type of thing where we have to think about the systems that we are involved in and how they require us to turn a blind eye to things that we know don't make sense, that are disruptive to students, and why it is that we have a system that, that allows itself 
to feed on um, being under-resourced for which there is no advocacy around what the system can and should be doing and whether it's actually supported in the appropriate ways despite all of the money that flows through it, right? We got to think about the data as a tool for transparency at the system level. So, you know, for me and my colleagues as well, but at the district, at the college, and we're relevant at department levels or division levels, and we need to test assumptions, right? Let's move away from this idea that because we like someone or because they mean well, that that is sufficient. Because if we do that, we end up in the same place we've been with desegregation hoping and waiting and not changing systems. So I encourage you all, as we continue to have this conversation to think about what it is, what is the problem you and your colleagues wanna solve, whether you are in transfer, whether you are in outreach, whether you are working in a high school, what is the problem that is facing black students? What is the local solution? How is that similar or different to the system level solution? And for those of you who have them for the system level, I am available. I would love to chat with you. Um, I believe that's my last slide. Is that my last slide, Carmel? No, so yes. You know, I love this um, Dr. Bettina Love talking about co-conspiring. Please conspire to support black students. Everything can be measured, even if it's imperfect. So please, you know, if you have questions, you ask me, I will be happy to think about those things with you. I have you asking this question about governance and use of resources. We have the federal money that's come to our system. How much of that aid is going to directly or indirectly to students? How much are your colleges? Do people know that in our system, colleges are carrying over, I don't know, average a million dollars a year? Why isn't that money being spent on students? Let's acknowledge the limitations of the data we have. No data are perfect. And so we really have to just, you know, sort of push on. Um, I'm sure these slides will be available for you all, but, you know, I hope that I've provoked some, some additional thinking um, about system level change. Again, people are doing the hard work, I know locally with individuals. The system level change, the questions that should be asked, and how we can work together to move forward. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Darla Cooper. I'm with the Research and Planning Group for California Community Colleges, um, also known as the RP Group. And I'm, I am following my, my colleague, Dr. Lundy Wagner, with some information that some of you may have heard me or others present before. But um, first of all, I think it's worth repeating now and many, many more times until something changes. And for those of you who haven't heard it, um, I hope that it will, um, it will affect you. That is what I hope. So let's go to uh, the next slide, please. So uh, there's a report and we will put the link in the chat. It's called Follow the Money. And what this report uh, uh, did was attempted to, to challenge how we have been looking at or how our public higher education system is being funded by the state and trying to take a different approach that does take race into account because our current approaches do not do that. And uh, that is a flaw. Um, this report was uh, put together by our colleagues at the Campaign for College Opportunity. And we're very grateful for their efforts in this regard. Let's please go to the next slide. So this is what uh, at least those of us here in the California Community College system are used to seeing the breakdown in terms of our three higher education segments and how they are funded by the state. You can see that the, the differences in terms of our, our UC, our CSU and our California Community College system and how that breaks down per student and that's per full-time uh, student. But th these are the calculations that most of us in the system are used to. And for my colleagues in, in states outside of California, welcome, we're glad you're here. Uh, we hope that even though this information is presented for California, that um, it relates to you and uh, maybe inspires you to, to find out if you don't know these numbers for your own state system of higher education, uh, maybe you'll go and seek them out. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. 
So again, that's how we, we just saw how we usually see the information broken out in terms of funding. And wanted to share with you, this is how our uh, students are attending these different institutions, uh, or again, just the publics, just our three public segments. And you can see that for our Black and Latinx students, it's 80 and 79% of those students who are in one of these three segments are attending a California community college. So some of you, uh, again, those of you who haven't heard this before might start be thinking, well, how do those two things intersect? How does that uh, relate to uh, the funding that was on the previous slide? So let's go to the next slide, please. So what we wanted to do was look at the funding by disaggregating it uh, by race. And when we did that and we looked at how much funding the state is spending per Black student, compared to students of other races, we did find a disparity. Um, and what we're hoping is that by putting a spotlight on this, that that will um, provoke discussion and again, hopefully change. Let's go to the next slide, please. So this is what that uh, analysis looks like. And what you will see there is, um, again, for the last four years, uh, how much when, when we calculate the funding per student versus uh, per black student, uh, per Asian student, per Latinx and per uh, white student, this is where you see the disparities. And the dotted line here shows again, what that average is across all four groups and that our, our, our black uh, students in particular, along with our Latinx co um, uh, colleagues, other, our other students are below the average uh, for uh, the, the state and what the state is funding. So if we had an equal funding model, then all four bars each year would be the same height. They would all obviously equal the average. And so what this does show is that our state is spending less money per black student every year. And you hopefully are asking yourself, is there a, a connection at least? Some, some kind of, uh, is it just a coincidence? that uh, between the, the, the performance that we often see among our Black students and this underfunding? I hope you're asking yourself that question. I hope you are. All right. I'm going to leave you with that thought, and I'm going to move to share uh, some findings from a new um, study that just was released, uh, I believe today, from the Campaign for College Opportunity. So let's go to our next slide, please. And not sure what happened to the graphic there, but uh, the, the new um, study looks at uh, college opportunity among black students by gender. And there are some uh, probably not surprising differences uh, there. Let's go to our next slide. Ah, there's the picture. <laughs> so the, um, thank you. So what we want to um, highlight first is that while there have been some increases in terms of the number of uh, black people in California who have a college education, there are still those gaps between um, black people and, and other races within the state. But also um, when we look at it by gender, though, those gaps um, can be wider. So for example, we have uh, a 20, uh, 20, percent, 20 percentage point gap among black men compared to white men in terms of having a college degree. And the gap for black women is 18%. Um, while black women have, more black women have a college degree, they're still lagging behind their white peers. So let's go to the next slide, please. So this, um, this graphic shows that again, and, it's very similar to the graphic I showed earlier in terms of the proportion of black students who are attending the three segments of higher education um, that are public. This particular graph uh, takes into account the private institutions. But even with taking that into account, you can see that almost two thirds of, of, of black students in higher education in California are attending a community college. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. So let's look at some outcomes. Um, and we're focusing particularly on, on our um, uh, community college students. And then I'm gonna share with you uh, how those community college students do after they transfer to the CSU or the UC. 
So the first uh, slide here is, I want to start with the good news. Okay. The good news is that while these rates are not where we would hope that they are, they have improved. You can see that the lines are trending up for all of these uh, groups for, and for both men and women. However, the not so good news is that the rate for white students is almost double that of black students. We have eight and 10% in, in the most recent um, cohorts of black men and women respectively. Um, who are getting their degree or certificate at the community college within um, either three or four years, right? Compared to 15 and 19% um, for white men and white women. Okay, let's go on to the next slide, please. An important note, and some of you may have picked up on it in, in the previous slide that, that, that of, of the, the donut there is that there was a pretty big slice uh, for private nonprofit. And we, when you look at that by gender, there's some pretty big disparities um, in terms of black men versus black women. So this graph shows when black students transfer, uh, where do they go? And how does that look men versus women? And what you see here is that more black women are transferring to for-profit uh, colleges uh, than to the UC and the CSU combined, combined. That is 44%, the very last column there, comp compared to 40% when you add 32 plus eight, okay? I'm going to let you, let that sit and sink in. Well, when we do the same comparison for black men, the numbers are 29%, in the second to the last column there in gray to the right, compared to 49%. Okay, let's say that again. 29% of black men are going to for-profit colleges versus 49% of black men are going to CSU and UC. Okay. Let's go to the next slide, please. So here we are looking at the, the graduation rates, the baccalaureate attainment rates for uh, community college students who transfer to the CSU. And again, I'll start with the good news. Um, they, again, these rates are improving over time for both black men and black women. Um, more than two thirds of black men and women who are, are transferring to the CSU are graduating within uh, four years of, of transfer. Unfortunately, the not so good news is that uh, these same similar gaps are persisting, again, for both black men and women when we compare it to our white peers. Uh, the gap in the four-year completion rate for black women is 11 percentage points, and the gap for black men is 10 percentage points. Let's go to the next, next slide, please. Now here's the same information, but for our stu black students who transfer to the UC. So again, the good news is that these two-year rates uh, are improving over time, um, but there is a gap between black men and black women in, uh, in terms of how much they've improved. Black women's rate has gone from 50 to 58%, whereas black men have only gone from 40 to 43. So the gains are not uh, the same. Um, what you can see is that by the time you get to four years out, the gaps are much more narrow. If you just kind of look at the two uh, sets of lines, the bottom set, there's much more space between the lines, which indicates a much larger gap, and that the, the lines are much closer together uh, by the time students are uh, four years. So our students are uh, closing those gaps uh, with a, with a couple of extra years, but is that what we want? Is that okay? Again, just raising questions for us to uh, consider. Um, another thing to point out here is that the, um, the gap, this 33 percentage point gap from the highest to the lowest, which you can see again in the bottom lines, uh, I'm just looking at that last cohort, 70% compared to 43%. That's, that's a 33 percentage point gap there. Compared to uh, up above, the gap is 91 
to 82, which is only a nine percentage point. Okay, to, to close out, I just want to thank a uh, special thanks to uh, Tyler uh, Campbell, who was the research fellow who led the data collection for this report and served as one of the authors, along with my colleagues, Michelle Siqueiros and uh, Vikash Reddy. Um, their report is on the website now. I'm, I hope that I've been seeing the, the chat flying through, but I don't know if someone, I'm hoping someone put the link to the, the reports there in, to both reports in the chat. And just to close out a little bit on uh, what the RP group is, is working on in this regard, we are uh, working on the first phase of our African-American tipping point study that examines findings from our original through the gate study that looked at transfer. And we found that among students who have completed all or most of their transfer requirements, black students, regardless of gender, are the most likely to transfer among that group. The problem is, many black students don't get that far in their journey. And so what we're trying to do is to find out what is the tipping point? Where, where, does it, where do black students' odds change? Where do their odds from being you know, not as likely to transfer change to being the most likely to transfer? So um, I hope you'll keep your eye out for those results in the coming months. We're very excited about uh, what we will find from that study and, and hope that it makes uh, a huge difference in, in moving our efforts forward to, as um, Dr. Lundy Ratner, Wagner says, we're changing the system. Not, it's not about changing the students. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper. Thank you, Dr. Lundy Wagner, for the important insights you shared, the important research insights and for setting the stage for what I know is going to be a very, very insightful panel discussion. Um, we will transition to our first panel, which will be moderated by Dr. Curry. And again, it's gonna be focusing on leveraging pol policy. And the panelists there will be Drs. Michelle Asha Cooper, Dr. J. Luke Wood, and Dr. Sean Harper. And so um, with that, we're going to invite Dr. Curry to go ahead and get us started. Thank you, uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Harris. I'm excited to be here with some of my colleagues within the uh, higher educational system. And I'm excited to start off with the conversation about how do we leverage our resources and leverage policy to do what's important for students. I just set the framework a little bit in regards to the work that we're doing at Compton College. I'm really engaged in black student recruitment and also Black student success. But I think it starts with having a conversation about data and utilizing that data to leverage uh, in conversations with elected officials, also with research scholars, and also with the, uh, the federal government. And so I would like to begin today's conversation with and start right into it with a question to Dr. Cooper. How can colleges leverage state and federal resources to address Black student recruitment and success? Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you all this afternoon. Um, it's, a, uh, it's great to be on this panel with uh, friends who I've known and worked with and collaborated with for a very long time. And it's also always good to be connected to my friends and colleagues in the state of California. Um, I am eager to return to the state of California as soon as we get clear with some of this pandemic. Um, but I, I miss you all, but I am I am still cheering you on and, and wishing for great things. And it is a delight to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, to your question, uh, Dr. Curry, about how do we leverage the dollars that are available through the federal government, I have a very simple answer. And that answer is to use them. Uh, through the federal government, uh, we have provided unprecedented amount of resources of that are uh, to colleges and universities as a part of our efforts to support uh, recovery post pandemic or during this pandemic. Uh, as a part of the Biden-Harris administration, we have a Build Back Better agenda that aims to improve and create an equitable educational system from cradle to career. And I'm very proud of the resources that we've been able to secure to, uh, for students and for institutions. For example, in March, President Biden signed the American Rescue Plan, which was a $40 billion investment into higher education. The American Rescue Plan is 
one of the largest single investments ever made in institutional and student grants into our nation's most under-resourced under -resourced colleges and universities like community colleges. Um, and it more than doubled the first two COVID recovery packages combined. So in total, in total, uh, close to $80 billion has been provided to higher education to support the recovery. Um, and a substantial amount of that has been provided to the state of California. And when I reviewed the, the data to see what the, the spending rate has been, only about a third of those resources that have been provided to the state of California had been used as of June 30th. So I want to encourage you to use them. Um, over the last several months, we have heard from students and parents who have shared with us how the emergency funds that are a part of the pandemic recovery um, have really helped their, their student, helped them, him, themselves to re-enroll and to persist in college. Um, at least half of the funds go directly to students to help with basic needs such as food, housing, and caregiving costs. Um, and you know, we, we've talked a lot to these students. So for example, there was a student by the name of Laura. Uh, Laura experienced the disruptive effects of COVID firsthand when she contracted the virus. Uh, and she was ill for, for three weeks, which meant she could not work for three weeks. And that meant she had no income for three weeks. And so when she received her emergency grant aid, she said it was a true blessing for her because it allowed her to cover basic needs like food, rent, and gas, but she also used a portion of it to purchase textbooks. And the emergency funds are also intended to help uh, higher education institutions emerge from the pandemic stronger than we went in. And it's important to say that we should not strive to make things like they used to be after all, Things were not universally all that great before the pandemic as the data that we've already seen today clearly shows. So emerging from this pandemic means that we discard those bad practices, those bad ideologies and do not carry them into our future. Um, we have a clearinghouse of really strong examples from across the nation, including things that we're, you're doing in California, including things you're doing at Compton College. Um, that really do support system level change. And I'd be happy to talk about that a little bit later on, but I, I wanna re really double down on the importance of uh, Dr. Lundy Wagner slide number 27 that talks about system level changes and really reinforce that many of the things that she just uh, highlighted in that slide can be used to support uh, uh, and through support recovery and her or her funds are allowable uses. And we are happy to help you discern what's allowable and not allowable. Uh, my colleagues and I at the Department of Education would be happy to help you with that. Thank, thank you. I'd like to, to, to pose this question to uh, Dr. Harper uh, regards to system level change and also how colleges can utilize the uh, federal dollars to support reopening it and really focus in on black students. What are some of your thoughts on that, Dr. Harper? Yeah, sure. Uh, President Curry, I appreciate your leadership. Uh, Dr. Cooper, congratulations on your new role. We are so lucky as a nation uh, to have you serving in such an important capacity. So thank you for your leadership. Um, Dr. Curry, one of the things that I have been thinking about, and Dr. Cooper is exactly right about this, that we have to actually use the dollars, um, but we ought not use them in a raceless way. The data are not raceless. The data make painstakingly clear to us uh, which students have been and continue to be most disproportionately affected. It would be a real mistake to embrace and continue to take on a, you know, a, a, a rising tide lifts all boats kind of mentality. Um, as we know, right, that there are several Black students and Indigenous students and Latinx students and lower income Asian American and Pacific Islander students who get drowned uh, when that tide raises, but yet um, our remedies are raceless. Uh, so that, that, would be, that would be my response, right? That we have to racialize our spending in response to what the data very clearly tell us. It's, it's, thank you, Dr. Harper. So Dr. Wood, what's your thoughts on that question? But then also, could you tie in how uh, the, what's happening to Black students and the COVID dollars can help support transfer? Well, the COVID dollars can certainly help to support, well, actually, before I jump in, it's good to be here. 
and it's a privilege to be on a panel with, with Drs. Harper and Cooper. And thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Curry, for the inter introduction and welcome. Um, the COVID dollars can certainly be used to help address uh, some of these issues. Um, mostly, if you think about uh, communities that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID, which is you know, how those funds are intended to be used, we know that the Black community has uh, borne disproportionate infections, unemployment, and loss of life during COVID-19. And so there, I think there's certainly opportunities, but uh, I think that what we really need to be focused on is how we can create better pathways for transfer for our, our students, right? Um, and ultimately that begins with conversation and that conversation has to be taking place with our, our CSUs, our UCs here in California and our community colleges and other states with their coordinating um, with, their, with their other uh, intersegmental partners. Um, we've thought about doing that in a number of different ways at, at our own institution. Um, one is through uh, a change in enrollment practices that we implemented just recently. And one of those changes is that we have an incredible program in the state of California called Emoja, right? That runs out of our community colleges that provides students with support. It's a retention-based program. Uh, it's an amazing wraparound support services for students. It serves uh, primarily black students. There's a uh, similar program such as Puente, which serve our Latinx population. There's a program uh, called Hubu, which serves our men of color. And ultimately what we've done uh, is we've looked at it from an, an institutional, in terms of institutional policy. And our new change in policy is that if a student has participated in one of those three programs, they now have special consideration to come into our campus, which is a highly impacted campus. That's, that's something new that every single CSU and every single UC could do. Now, it's a policy conversation because ultimately you can't just say, hey, we're going to change it. it ha there's a, a process whereby you have to engage community members, you have to engage stakeholders in having those conversations. And then it has to go uh, through the shared governance process at the institutional level and then at the system level. That's just an example of the type of commitment that it's gonna to take to really start to redress some of these issues. But it also puts pressure on uh, community colleges that may, and to varying degrees, have either supported or not been as supportive of those types of programs to see that these as primary pathways into, um, into four-year institutions. Um, ultimately, we've also looked at doing what are called microsites, and we're doing it. We have one at Southwestern, College, San Diego Mesa College, and another other institutions that are essentially allowing students to have, uh, they do their first two years at their local community college, and then they continue their next two years at that local community college, but in a program that is a joint operation between our institution and that community college. Because ultimately, we have to recognize that we can't just have a come to us strategy, we have to also have a go out to strategy, right? It's the and both. And that requires us to have a footprint at our local community colleges, which have the highest density of high performing students of color. And so it's about in, in, enacting uh, system levels change in order to address this. And I think that the, the data that was shown earlier uh, by Dr. Cooper, uh, not Dr. Cooper, uh, by Darla rather, um, also really serves to, to really um, paint the, this picture because one of the things that you're seeing is a high degree of these students who are now transferring to for-profit institutions, right? They're transferring to institutions that aren't going to serve them as well, the institutions where they're gonna have higher loan debt, institutions that when they get on the opposite end of their experience, they may not be able to find the types of gainful employment. And yes, 38% of our students who are transferring are transferring to those for-profit institutions when they're black, but we have to go back to the report that was done before that several years ago, which showed that that was only 15% in the first report that we that our, the Campaign for College Opportunity did. So that rose from 15% to 38% in a very short time frame. It's, a, it's an issue that we need to, to be attentive to, certainly. Uh, Dr. Kerr, I can see you, you wanted to no, speak. No, I, I, I was going to let you continue, but then I, I want to push you a little bit regards to race conscious decision-making and funding and allocation of dollars at colleges. And what are some of your thoughts on that? Because you talked about different programs, but how does senior level administrators, faculty, staff begin having conversations on their campuses 
regards to the allocation of funds? Well, I mean, it begins with the commitment. I mean, ultimately you have to have leadership that believes that it's, it, it's important, that it's timely, that it's urgent and being willing to basically communicate that. Uh, you know, your budget is a, is a representation of, of institutional priorities. And so like at our institution, it's an institutional priority. So we're hiring people who are focused specifically on those partnerships. Why? Because it's important. People can say all they want, but people at this point, I believe, aren't willing for statements without action. If there's no action behind it, then it's just a false promise. I also think that there are some state level policy changes that could also help to advance this. You know, in California, we have what's called the ADT, the Associate's Degree for Transfer. There's a, an assembly, uh, there's a bill right now, AB 928 uh, by Berman called the, the STAR Act, which would create even more pathways for our, our transfer students. It, it does a number of different things. One, it recognizes that we don't have intersegmental coordination, right? The CSU does one thing, UC does one thing, community college does another. It basically brings those individuals across those systems to have conversations on what should count what uh, and, and articulation um, across different systems. That's an imperative if we're thinking about um, California as serving uh, students in a thoughtful way. Uh, the second thing that it does is it creates streamlined pathways for high unit majors. We know that, for example, ADT, the benefit of having ADT is that once you finish that ADT at the community college and associate degree for transfer, you're going to be guaranteed to go into a CSU. But we have few ADTs in math. We have few ADTs in engineering. And if we think about where the nation is trying to push, it's a focus on STEM. And it's been a focus on STEM for many years now. But if we think about math, we think about engineering, we think about health sciences, there has to be those conversations that are taking place. And that's an opportunity because, again, the highest density of our underrepresented students of color, our black students, our brown students, our native students are aware. They're at our community colleges. And so we have to have that seamless pathway. The other thing that it does is, and I've seen this in my own work here at, at SDSU, you have students who could have done an ADT who didn't and then our, our struggle to be able to get into a system that has now moved more towards the ADT. And here's one of the reasons why it occurs. It's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons. If I'm at a community college and I'm a professor, right? So I love teaching my classes, the ones that really speak to me, right? I love teaching my classes that I got to create by myself, but ultimately they might not fit within that articulated pathway. And so sometimes what you see is that because of that desire to be able to encourage students to take a, a wide range of courses and it falls within academic freedom. So I recognize that there's some, some complexities here. So this isn't in any way saying anything negative about, about faculty or about any, any stance on this, but it provides a default pathway, right? So that the ADT is the constant and then a choose, student choosing not to do that. Now that's something that is a student level choice. I think that that's what we need because ultimately one of the things that we know is if we don't create systems that create better pathways, then ultimately our, our community colleges and our universities are failing our, our state. And ultimately, they're not just failing everybody, they're failing disproportionately black and brown communities. So I, I wanna push this conversation a little bit and uh, Dr. Cooper talked about one third of the federal dollars have been spent through June 30th. And we know that there's an issue regards to black recruitment and success and retention at California Community Colleges. How do we push the colleges to spend the money right now? Because if one third is only being spent, we know there's a need. What recommendation or advice would you give to us to push to spend these dollars? Are you directing that to me? Yes. Okay. Um, I am, you know, my team and I, we are 100% available to you to help you determine what types of things you can use. You know, I, I want to really double down on the fact that at the administration, we are deeply committed to equity. And I will go as far to say, Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona and I are unapologetically committed to racial equity and the advancement of people of color, which includes black students. That is a primary reason why I get up and do this work each and every day. And so we wanna support your efforts in getting this right. We as an administration have put out an executive order saying that we are going to uh, advance and uplift and focus on racial equity through systemic and policy change. And it is 
uh, I invite you, I should say, to hold us accountable to doing what we say we are going to do. And one of the ways that you can hold us accountable is making sure that you partner with us to get the work done. What we know is that transforming higher education is going to require that we uplift diversity, uplift equity, uplift inclusion in all facets of the educational system. That means that we are going to need to understand and identify and really address head on these systemic barriers that we've been talking about this afternoon. And these systemic barriers are a problem because of the inequities that they create on our campus, but they have really created a system of haves and have nots that become drivers of inequitable outcomes into our workforce and into our communities. Uh, and that is a huge problem. So as you are working to you know, dismantle and uplift and really lift up the hoods, come to us. We have an example of some of the promising practices that we have seen. I can just rattle off a few that I, I know to work. Um, for example, we have seen institutions discharge institutional aid. This is a huge win for our students. It's a huge win for our institutions. We've seen HBCUs take the lead in this effort. I have parents who call and say that because the institution discharged the debt this semester, that is the only reason that their son or daughter is going back to college. So the, the discharging institutional debt allows students to persist. It allows them to re-enroll. It removes this transcript hold, which is a bad thing in general. Removing the transcript hold lets students get access to that transcript. And if they want to transfer, they can. It also allows students who have earned college degrees get access to their degrees. So that is a, a really important thing. Um, we've seen help with technology, broadband support, technology support, access to computers, Wi-Fi. Those things matter. We know that our communities have been underserved in their access to those types of resources. Mental health supports. Um, I heard earlier one of the speakers talked about how the pandemic has disproportionately affected Black communities. We know that to be true. So helping with mental health supports, things and that could include waiving the student health fees at your institution so students can get easier access to those services is an allowable use of funds. Outreach to re-engage students that we lost during the pandemic. Uh, provisions that help students with wraparound supports, basic needs, all the vaccinations. These are all kinds of things that allow us to really move forward in helping with recovery but also when we are intentional in terms of who we're gonna focus on, and in this case, we're talking about the black students in the case of California who have been declining in their enrollments, we really can really uh, move forward in some of our advancements related to racial equity as well. You President know, Curry, I'm glad, I'm, can, can I jump in on this one? President Kerr, you asked a really important uh, question about racializing policy and spending. Um, and having race conscious uh, policymaking and spending. Yes, and I think there's a both and opportunity here, right? Um, I wanna pick up on something that uh, Michelle was saying, uh, Dr. Cooper, about practices, right? Like we have to also think about racializing institutional practices. Um, I wanna just double click on something that I believe it was Dr. Lundy Wagner who said earlier that money alone won't fix it. It's not just money, right? We have to also think about, you know, the practice implications here. So I want to pick up on a data point that someone shared at the top of our experience here this afternoon, that there are more than 35,000 fewer Black students enrolled in California community colleges in 2020 than there were in 2014. So for me, it invites, it, it invites an interrogation of some practice questions. For example, what does our institution do specifically to recruit and enroll black students? How have the strategies and approaches that we employ shifted between 2014 and 2020? How do admission officers here at our institution talk about race? How are they talking specifically about the trend of declining enrollments among black students? Is the office responsible for recruiting and admission and enrollment a site of racial avoidance? Meaning is it a space where professionals purposefully resist engaging in important conversations about race? It invites a question about who the people are, right? 
how many of the recruiters and admission officers are black? Have there ever been any black professionals in these roles at our institution? If so, how many over each of the past 10 years, right? Uh, do they have any power and authority? It's the responsibility of recruiting black students entirely on their shoulders and everyone else gets to opt out. And then here's a money question. How much money do we spend specifically to recruit black students, right? Those are some important racialized questions of practice that I think every community college ought to be grappling with given the data that have been shared with us about the declining black student enrollments specifically um, over the past several years. And, and, and Dr. Harper, I, I, you know, those questions we should, we should put out there for college presidents to be able to answer, have those conversations on their campuses. But what's interesting about your question and what you've thrown out or your charge is that there's federal dollars, but there's also state dollars. So in the California state budget, they included money as relates to outreach and re-engagement. And so how are colleges going to utilize those dollars to outreach for Black students or any other students on their campuses? So begin to interrogate their colleges to have these questions answered about what are you going to do differently? Because it's not just about having the money. It's about what are we going to do differently to address Black student recruitment and success? It's also, Keith, about what are you going to tell Black students, even if you are leveraging the dollars and you're going out and you're forming partnerships with, you know, predominantly Black organizations and communities and families and churches and all of that. What are you going to tell Black students, right, about the culture and climate of the place? Um, you know, the truth is, Dr. Curry and everybody else, right, um, I'm not sure that we're poised uh, or willing, rather, to tell Black students the truth. The truth is that a prospective Black student, we would have to say to that person, if we're going to tell them the truth, that, yeah, you're not going to see very many Black people here. You're not going to see very many Black students. Uh, you're going to have very few Black instructors in all of the courses that you take. Most of the Black people that you see working at the community college that we're trying to recruit you to, they're going to be working in food service and custodial roles and groundskeeping. You ought to respect those people and appreciate uh, what they bring to the college. But just a heads up, they're not going to be your dean, your department chair. They're not going to be in charge of anything, right? They're not going to have very much power and authority to you know, improve your experience. We have to tell the truth to Black students that, yeah, you're not going to read very much about yourself in the formal curriculum. In fact, you know, your cultural interests, your cultural identity, your cultural history is going to be pretty much erased in just about every class you take. Occasionally, your professor is going to stereotype or microaggress you. Um, occasionally, somebody who is white on your campus is going to call you the N-word. A lot of times, those people are going to be peers of yours, but sometimes it might be an employee of the institution, just a heads up. Right. Uh, is that a place that, I don't know, that, that, that a prospective Black student will want to enroll? No. Our climate data very clearly signaled to us and confirmed for us that those are the experiential realities of Black students. So um, I think, frankly, while the data of declining enrollments horrify me, I think it would be irresponsible for us to suddenly go out and start recruiting a whole bunch of Black students without also simultaneously attending to the climate issues that undermine their persistence, that undermine their transfer, that undermines their academic performance. But would you also say, Dr. Harper, that colleges should be, uh, employees should be looking for their climate survey and their climate data to begin having those conversations check the website or ask someone for a copy of it? And then how is that integrated into the campus culture? And also how is that integrated into the decision-making for your campus? Would you say that? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Keith, as you know, the 68 member institutions in our California Community Colleges Racial Equity Leadership Alliance is, uh, has done our uh, student campus climate survey uh, in year one of the Alliance and will be doing climate surveys for staff in year two and faculty in 2023. Um, I'm very proud of those 68 institutions doing the climate survey, but to your point, it's not just enough to do the survey. You have to then make the results actionable. The results absolutely must inform campus strategy, campus policy, uh, resource allocation, and so on.
Yeah, I just want to jump in there. Like if if we don't take that information from those campus climate surveys and do something about it to inform policymaking at all levels, the institutional level, the state level and the federal level, then we've actually done nothing more than done another campus climate survey. And having been in this work for quite some time, I've seen lots of campus climate surveys. And we are at a point, we are at a critical juncture where we have people like you all who are willing to give up a Wednesday afternoon to participate in a conversation like this. We have an entire state of leaders who are willing to talk about the declining representation of black students. We have people at the state level in California who are trying to do more. We have folks like me at the federal government who are saying we're gonna give it our all. So this is a time to make sure that this is, that our rhetoric actually matches our policy decision-making at every level, if we truly want to make sure we're not just simply hitting the replay button on this conversation five and 10 years from now. So, so Dr. Wood, I, I will I let you close this out with this question. How do we avoid using the replay button as relates to these dollars? Well, I'll, I'm gonna get to that question, but I wanna expand on one small thing here. So yes, what Dr. Harper just said absolutely impacts our students, but I also know from his work as well that it also impacts the black faculty and staff themselves too, right? And that climate work is like the students are in many ways uh, emblematic of what the faculty and staff of those institutions are experiencing. And I think if we think about uh, William Smith's work on racial battle fatigue, we know that there are not just psychological impacts, but physiological impacts that come from those who, who are um, experiencing it. I mean, in terms of, of what people have to do that goes beyond just you know, statements, I think there's a lot of things. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, Dr. Harper and others have mentioned, you know, there's an underrepresentation of faculty and administrators who are going to look like the students themselves. Uh, making changes in hiring is not rocket science. It's not a function of, of creating some crazy policies or some changes that go through Senate and share governance. It's about commitment. Like a campus can commit to doing cluster hires in faculty, cluster hires in staff, right? There's very clear ways. I mean, even at my own institution, when we started here in our administration, we had 25 black faculty. We're at 42 now. Why? Because we did a cluster hire. Why? I give him one second to come back on. Dr. Woods, we got you. So I want to say we're, we're out of time and I want to turn it back over. I want to say thank you to the panelists for being involved in this conversation. We're going to send out those questions that uh, Dr. Harper mentioned during this conversation. But I say thank you to the panelists and turn it back over to Dr. Harris. Uh, thank you, Dr. Curry, for your, your expert moderation and facilitation of the first panel. Uh, that was amazing. That was insightful. Um, before we transition to the next panel, I need to give two important shout outs. First is to Carmel Malixi, who's the project manager for the Equity Avengers. You cannot see her. Um, she's managing the, the, uh, the slides and the technology behind the scenes, but she's been an absolutely integral part of this webinar happening. So I want to thank and acknowledge her. Um, the second, next slide, is to acknowledge our colleagues at the Campaign for College Opportunity. Um, I know that some of them were, were on, hopefully they're still on, uh, Michelle Sequeiros, Audrey Dowell, and Jesse Ryan, just for their, their amazing work in leading the policy conversation within our state. Um, sharing important research insights and reports. Uh, two of the reports, the Follow the Money report and report that they released today on um, gender equity for black students um, were referenced in today's webinar. We'll have both of those reports available to you as resources. Um, the links have been posted in the chat uh, as well. So we just wanna thank them. They also have a very important conversation that they'll be leading on September 23rd. Uh, you see the information here, please visit their website to learn more about this. They're going to be engaging in a policy conversation with the um, 
the leaders of the three public systems of higher education in California. So this is certainly not one you want to miss. And I think it's going to be an important next step in the conversation that we're having today. Uh, next slide. So with that being said, again, I want to thank our first panelists um, and introduce our second panel, which again is going to be moderated by Dr. Pamela Luster from San Diego Mesa College. This panel will focus more on, on leveraging institutional resources and initiatives. And again, our participants will be Dr. Tina King, Dr. Erica Inger Jonas, and Dr. Ed Bush. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Luster. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. And it is an honor and a privilege to be with you all today and especially to be joined by my wonderful Hello. colleagues who I know well and know will bring it. So uh, we have uh, some mighty shoes to fill from our last panel. I'm excited today to, okay. to be with these colleagues because I think now that we've seen the numbers and we've seen some of the policy implications, we can bring this to the campus level, the college level, these institutions that we're very much a part of and really start to think deeply about what we need to do as institutions to meet this moment. And so I want to start with a question for all three panelists, uh, because I know they've asked this question of their students. Hey, Pam, Why? Oh. can you hear me? Because I, I can't see myself on the on the we can hear you, Erica. screen, but you can't see me. We can see we can see you and we can hear you. Oh, Perfect. OK, great. I'm sorry. I'm not showing up. That's OK. You're good. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> it's all good. No, we're happy. Okay, thanks. We're happy you're here. All right. So, thank you. So from your perspective. And when you think about this decline in us as community colleges serving black students, what are you hearing from your students? Because I know you ask. And from your institution level, what do you know is happening that's directly related to this? And I'm going to go to Dr. King first. Thank you so much, Dr. Lester. I first wanna say I'm so excited to be here and I'm very excited to be on the panel with colleagues that I admire tremendously. Um, to answer your question, I, in regards to um, what Black students are probably saying in regards to their enrollment, et cetera, um, I think a couple of things that I've heard at different institutions and um, even at the institution that I'm currently at Southwestern College, uh, not specifically to this institution, but I'll say that not all institutions have fully invested in understanding how to support Black students. Mm -hmm. When I say that, what I mean is identifying who our Black students are so that we are equipped to support their needs, right? So has the data been collected? Have qualitative um, focus groups been done so that we truly understand what our Black students' needs are so that we can inform the educators on our campus so that they are equipped to support those needs? And also uh, informing our college employees on the needs, right? So making sure that they're aware, but also providing the tools to support those needs. And lastly, uh, we need to make sure that we're doing a better job in reviewing the success metrics for our uh, data metrics for our Black students on our campus annually, and making sure that information is shared publicly with not only our educators and our employees, but also our students. So those are just a couple of things that I'd like to start with. Excellent. I will throw it over to Dr. Andrew Jonas. I'm going to echo a lot of what Dr. King said, because I think it's true uh, at Pasadena City College. I think it's true at a lot of colleges that um, what our Black students want to know is where can they go for help and who is going to help them? And are those individuals going to understand where they're coming from? And so that needs to be visible. You know, we need to do a much better job of communicating. This is what we have available. This is how we're trying to help you. And also opening it up to say, what is it you need from us? What do you need for, uh, from us uh, so that we can help you? Whatever that looks like. And I think it's really challenging for community colleges for a variety of reasons to really look at the narrative of what's happening at their college, look at it, really interrogate it and say, you know, this is true. Um, I know when I arrived at the college two and a half years ago, the narrative of this college is that we have not done a good job with African-American students or African-American employees. And there's a lot of truth to that. So part of it is saying, 
listening to the narrative, accepting that the narrative is true and not trying to just say, well, that may have been true in the past, it's not true now. No, it actually, it, it is true. And then saying, but what am I gonna do about it? And articulating what that looks like and demonstrating that we hear, that we hear um, what is being said and then demonstrating what the actions are. And they come in many forms from programs, hiring, and just you know, bringing together affinity groups and listening. And so I think it's a lot, it's a lot of transparency. I guess that's the big word. It's really about transparency and follow through. I see you, Dr. Bush, jump on in. Yeah, you see me getting ready to, to get ready to pipe up. Uh, I'm still just reflecting on Dr. Harper's questions. Uh, I mean, those were uh, absolutely um, gut-wrenching in, in many ways as we reflect on what kind of message we are sending African-American students. But in my conversation with, 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 with Black students, um, I think there's a couple of questions and thoughts that they have. Uh, I think one question is, is they ask, do, do they matter? Uh, to what extent are they seen? Are they, are they affirmed? Um, is this a place that cares for them, that sees them? And I think ultimately, although it hasn't been directly articulated in this way, but as I interpret the conversation and, and kind of sort through the subtext of what it is that they're saying, I think ultimately they're asking the question is, do you love me? And then do you love me enough to do things differently, to be able to support my success, to be able to validate who I am, because if you really care, then you would change your practices. You would change how you serve me. You would, you would change how you teach me and what you teach. That you will recognize my contribution of me and the contributions of my community and the contributions of my people. I think they're saying, don't see me as a deficit, but see me for my strengths and what I bring to the table. Um, that I'm not a charity case, that I'm not the problem in the room that needs to be fixed. I think they're asking us to reevaluate our actions, reevaluate how we do business. And I think they would say that they are tired to be the ones that have to make the adjustment in order for us to feel more comfortable in their presence. Thank you, all three of you. Um, one of my next uh, questions on this is to what extent do your colleagues uh, recognize that we have a challenge, that we have a problem, right? What, to what extent, and you can take that as colleagues within your institutions, colleagues within you know, our CEOs and executives, what, whatever colleagues you'd like to identify. And, and how, do you, how do you know those things? To, to what extent are colleagues really engaged in this work with us? And, and I will start with Dr. Bush. Yeah, I could speak on my institution. I'm, I'm really fortunate. I mean, we have a set of dedicated, you know, student services, instructional professionals that truly understand um, the type of work that needs to happen. And I want to say that this is a huge problem, but it's not a problem without a solution. And I want to offer this just so we know what's possible. So like many institutions, right, CRC has suffering from declining enrollment. I mean, my institution is down five to six. 6%. Um, and so for a year to year from fall of 2020 to fall of 21, we are down in every student demographic with the exception, with the exception of African American students. So despite the national trend, despite the state trend, we actually have 38 more African American students enrolled this fall than we did last fall. And that's because it is a concerted effort. Um, our outreach specialist who is, is, is tasked with leading our African-American student outreach efforts says it this way in an email to me. She said is that we do this work now out loud. That before it was a secret how we operated, our equity work was, was fairly quiet. And our outreach staff and our counseling team went directly to our K-12 district and said, we're gonna begin to prioritize how we utilize our resources in the outreach that we're gonna be intentionally targeting the high schools from our nine leading districts by the number of African-Americans enrolled in those high schools and the number of undocumented students, which were two populations that we have been focused on as a district 
and as an institution. And so our counseling faculty, other Black faculty, staff, and volunteers, our outreach team literally called hundreds of African-American students who applied but did not enroll and to tell them, look, this is an institution that is going to support you and is going to see you. Our collective partnership with communities organizations like uh, Improve Your Tomorrow and the 1300 campaign, I've had some time, we'll talk about it, that is seeking to um, have 1,300 more men of color graduate from UC Davis and Sac State by the year 2025. And for those men of color that's in our in that particular area, we worked with those two universities where no men of color receives a denial letter, that every student is accepted to something. And these students were accepted to attend our community college in Los Rios in order to be able to go on to get their bachelor's degree in UC Davis. So it is absolutely possible when we are intentional about saying that we're going to direct resources, time, energy, money, and effort to actively recruit and identify African-American students who want to come to our institutions. Excellent. Dr. King or Dr. Andrew Jonas, anything you'd like to add? Because I do have other questions as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that quickly and say that I think, um, number one, we've done some of the same things here. You know, a great team reached out to our uh, group of 400, over 400 African-American students who had in who had applied but not enrolled in fall 2021. And we were able to get 208 out of those 400 students to enroll in spring 2021. And so it's that kind of effort. But I think my role as a CEO is really to bring the money and say, yes, that's possible. So when um, there, you know, when through shared governance, a request for a physical space for our Black Student Success Center came through, I supported it and paid for it. And then when there was a request that came for a Black Student Success Counselor, I paid for it even though it got added to the list late for faculty hiring. And there are, and I've paid for uh, really focused Black STEM classes that are just African-American students in STEM and math classes. And, um, you know, in all of those ways in which I, as the president say, yep, that's what we're gonna do. We're going to, we've hired a, a uh, chief diversity equity and inclusion officer who started in mid November and as of two weeks ago is now the associate vice president and chief diversity equity and inclusion officer um, because there's so much fabulous work going on. And I think the last part of it is that if you remove the, we don't have the resources to do that and instead say, yes, we do and here's how we're gonna pay for it. It's amazing the ideas that come forward, especially reimagining this um, artificial division we have in our colleges that's instruction or student services. Well, now we have the, the division of diversity, equity and, and justice, which is where the Black Student Success Center is. And so we have to get it out of our mindsets that it is a student services responsibility. It's all of our responsibility, but as long as we stay to that really rigid view of what an institution should be and how it should be structured, we'll never actually make any progress. Okay. I just want to shell, shell out amen every time you guys get done talking <laughs> here. Um, Dr. King, I'm gonna shift if that's okay, um, to a question about the call to action. Uh, we had a very clear call to action last summer by Chancellor Oakley, um, responding to the need to actively strategize around structural racism, particularly around our Black and African American students. And can you talk a little bit about the work that Southwestern did to invest in your own call to action? Because I know that there was a body of work that was created. Can you talk a little bit about how you address that at Southwestern? Sure, thank you so much, Dr. Lester. We've done a series of things to address the call to action in response to um, uh, what uh, each Chancellor Eloy Oakley put out. Um, for one, we've invested heavily in the professional development um, for our Office of Equity and Engagement for our employees, as well as for our student body. Um, one of the things that I'm very proud of and I think has been amazing is our um, director, executive director of equity and engagement has launched ADA. And ADA is primarily 
a program that is for our faculty members to look at equity-minded approaches in the classroom. And so that through that work, we've seen great results. In addition to that, uh, we've launched um, several different um, modules and trainings for our student bodies, and specifically our associated student organization. They have to go through a series of trainings focused on microaggressions all the way to um, race combating racism um, within their frame as a student and being student activists. Um, in addition to that, we have collectively as a college work to um, create uh, policies. We're in the process of developing a board policy um, that will uh, really primarily focus on the work of equity and to address the call to action from Eloy Oakley. So those are a couple things that we've done thus far. Um, and I'd like to share more in the, the next uh, part as well. Dr. Bush, same question. Yeah, run, run, run a question by me again. I was so caught up in, in listening to the response and didn't think you was going to no come problem. back my way. Hit, hit me know, with it again. Uh, <laughs> Chancellor Oakley issued our call to action last oh, year. Oh, yeah, I got you. Specifically focused yeah. after the murder of George Floyd on a focus for community colleges on Black and African students and so African American students. Um, what were some of the CRC intentional outcomes to yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, I mean, we, we were in this work prior to George the unfortunate death of George Floyd, uh, even though that was a catalytic moment. And we also use that as an opportunity to double our efforts at, at CRC. I mean, our equity work didn't, didn't start there, but very specifically our college um, in the fall of 2020, um, really that summer launched a real attentional effort that we call the We Won't Fall initiative. Um, and that's a play on words. So we won't fall means that we were not going to allow any of our students, uh, particularly black and brown students, which is the focus of the campaign, um, to fall through the cracks during the pandemic. And this was our way to address what we call institutional racism in a time of a pandemic. And also was a recognition that fall was not going to be business as usual. Um, so we set 13 very clear targets um, all focus on the first semester experience of African-American and Latino and Latina students. Um, and those targets was around what students needed to hit in terms of early educational milestones that we know will lead to longer term uh, academic um, success and, and outcomes. And the 13 targets was also symbolic. Um, the 13 targets that we land on was also very uh, symbolic as it relates to the 13th Amendment and the, the kind of push-pull around um, the 13th Amendment in terms of outlawing enslavement, but at the same time still having uh, an ever-growing prison industrial, industrial complex where free labor is still actually a thing. And so our college continues to organize around that work. We have embedded it in our college institutional documents. It is the focus of our quality focus essay and accreditation. So we continue to be very intentional and being loud around our unapologetic effort to improve outcomes from the students who have been the most historically marginalized in our institutions. I'm gonna pick up on something you just said because if we're going to bust systems, we have to recreate our own. And I love this idea that accreditation can be used. Any system that we have that measures our own success can be specifically focused on the work that we're talking about here right now. I love this idea of embedding. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Dr. Andrew Gunas, did you want to add to this question? The, only, the, uh, the one thing I was going to add is a great example of how it forced our college to really start to take a look at those at that uh, institutional racism, especially as it relates to our uh, campus police. Uh, one of the first things we did was start you know, going from the beginning to the end of our general orders manual to look at how our campus police were approaching policing. And just so you know, our campus police do not carry weapons, so they don't have guns on campus. But one thing that came out, which was highly disturbing and that we need to do better is that a great example of before the pandemic hit in February of 2020, um, we had two celebrations going on on the same day, one for Chinese New Year in one part of the campus and one for African American History Month in another part of the campus. The Chinese, the Chinese New Year celebration 
had no police presence whatsoever. And the African-American history celebration had four police officers. And it's those kinds of things that we as an institution have to take a really hard look at and say, wait a minute, how did we get there? How did we get to the point where we identified one activity as needing presence and not another? And then I think getting back to your last point, Pam, I would say, I think one of the most difficult conversations that we have now and will have going forward is accountability. Because we can have all this money, we can create all of these activities, all of these programs, but if we're not willing to set benchmarks about what we wanna see from those programs, and if at the end of the year, we're not willing to sit down and take a hard look at, we had these resources, these were our plans, and look, did we or did we not accomplish what we want to do? If we don't hold ourselves accountable, if CEOs aren't asking questions, if every person in leadership isn't asking questions of themselves, of the people who serve our students, we will never ever make a difference. And I, and I can't stress that enough. It, that's one of the places where those hard conversations have to take place, accountability. I'm going to switch it up for a minute and ask you all a question that uh, maybe you didn't get a chance to see before we started this. Uh, we have this incredible opportunity with resources that we've received this year to hire full-time faculty. Many millions of dollars to each of our districts. Um, I know that that all of us, uh, or, or many of us, have done um, truly a heroic work given the backdrop of where we are right now with some of the, the noise in our system around uh, critical race theory and some of those things that are out there in the big wide world. What does it look like to be intentional around faculty hiring? Uh, we talk a lot about HR practices and you know all of those kinds of things. And I have lots of thoughts on this, but I'm the moderator. So I'm gonna ask the three of you, what does it look like to be intentional? And as you think about this next tranche of dollars that we just received to hire full-time faculty, how will we focus on hiring black and African-American faculty? Who do you wanna hit, do that first? I, I could take, I could give this one real quick, concrete example um, that we started right before the pandemic and we would definitely continue um, with this new round of, of faculty that we have coming as a result of state, state funding. Um, so we, I think we're probably the only community colleges, a lot of colleges on, so put it in the chat if I'm wrong, that leverage our student equity and achievement dollars to, to hire a contract employee with a specific focus on increasing the number of diverse applicants in our faculty pools. And so we charge them with really guiding applicants through the entire process to demystify um, the steps necessary for folks to get hired in our institution, particularly those populations, and we're talking primarily black and brown, but other underrepresented groups who just lack the kind of the internal uh, lexicon and information necessary to make their application pop um, when someone is reviewing it to know the insider information as it relates to how to navigate the, the process. And so we believe that faculty representation is the key, uh, one of the key components to lead to greater success among our students and students of color. So we felt it was important to direct resources in that way. And we're gonna continue that effort uh, with this new round of faculty hires. Thank you, who'd like to jump in next? Whoever unmutes quicker. <laughs> okay, I'll. Uh, oops, yeah, one, I'll two, go. three, go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's about making sure that we have um, as broad an approach to doing those applications. Um, I'm going to give a little shout out to the USC Center on Racial Equity because we use their PRISM system which is an opportunity to get the word out to a diverse pool, as well as uh, using their services to look at job ads, to make sure that we are intentional and that we are looking for 
uh, candidates from all walks of life that we are, that we want you, you know, that we really want you and advertising in not just, you know, the Chronicle of Higher Education, that's not going to get you mm -hmm. uh, a broad pool. But I think the other thing is that we want to make sure that once we have faculty here, that we have a welcoming environment for the faculty. And so I think we have to think about it, not just let's try to get them in the door, let's make sure that all of our committees are trained uh, for implicit, you know, about implicit bias and EEO and all of that, but also let's think what kind, what are, what world are we going to create for these new folks that we're bringing in? And how do we encourage them that this is where they want to come to serve the students they want to serve in our diverse community college system? Thank you, Dr. King. I'm going to let you finish this one out and then we are rounding third and moving towards home. Okay, so I just want to share really quickly because I think Dr. Bush and Dr. Ingen Ingen Jonas, I've already touched on it, but a couple of things that we've done is, um, you know, in particular myself and Dr. Shabazz, we actually went out to a faith-based um, community event, and this was during the time that we were both hiring um, out there to a, an event that primarily uh, Black, African American, people of color were at that we could promote positions within both of our colleges. In addition to that. Um, also promoting directly and recruiting at HBCUs and minority serving institutions has also been a piece of our tactic. But I also like something that was just shared. I think it's important for us to focus on the new faculty that we'll be bringing in, but also recognizing that we have to make sure they're successful when, we, when they get here. And so I, I know I shared it already, but going back to the program that we've implemented here at Southwestern College, particularly for faculty, um, which is IATA Advancing Equity Teaching Academy, to make sure that our faculty are successful and they have the tools so that they can be successful and see um, how they implement the equity-minded approach in the classroom. So those are some of the strategies we've done and other areas and ways in which we um, try to continue to support our faculty once they're here on our campus. Thank you. I have one last question for you because we are uh, short on time. And Dr. Bush, I understand you're going to close us out. So I am going to turn to Dr. King and Dr. Andragonis just to say, are there additional insights, strategies? We've had a short period of time here together, but the one or two tangible things that to the you know many thousands of people that are on here, they're looking for what can I do right now? From wherever I sit at the institution, what can I do? And so what might those things be? Dr. King? So just thinking about the HERF dollars, I just want to share a couple of things that we're doing at Southwestern College um, to support our Black students and our students in general. Um, it's been shared, but providing uh, funding to our students direct aid, we've given over $11 million in direct aid, and now we're in the process of disbursing $17 million. Um, in addition to that, we've also launched a student forgiveness project to eliminate our student debt by implementing this student forgiveness plan. And that's critical because we know that we lost many of our students due to the pandemic. For us in March of 2020, we lost about 20,000 units from students stopping out. And so some of that has impacted our students with debt. So by eliminating the debt and encouraging them to come back, that is a way to help our students come back and to support the equity work. Um, also, a couple things we've done is ramped up our basic needs support, similar to many colleges. Um, we've invested millions of dollars in funds to support our students, such as in hotel vouchers, laptop technology devices, et cetera. And you know, with the hotel vouchers, uh, one of the things that we've done is created a partnership with the local hotel here so that students who are unsheltered have access to weekly vouchers. And the last piece of this I'd like to share is that we've also invested lots of funding in our personal wellness center. We know that students have been impacted through the, the pandemic and making sure that our students are supported holistically is important. So that's another um, area that we, we work heavily in as well. And I'll just end quickly and say, keep sharing your ideas and work through shared governance. Um, the Black Student Success Center as a physical space came through shared governance. There are processes in place and just keep sending those ideas forward. And I, I can't stress it enough. And my CEO colleagues out there, listen, listen. 
Thank you. I'm going to turn this back over to Dr. Harris. Thank you so much, Dr. Bush, Dr. Antigonis, and Dr. King. So enjoyed being on this panel with you today. And a big shout out to Dr. Luster again for uh, expert facilitation. Um, Want to also thank uh, the panel of experts on our second panel for doing an amazing job. Um, we have unfortunately reached the end of our time. I know I've been watching the chat and I know that uh, many of us would like to continue the conversation. And so we need to come up with ways to do that. Make sure you register and attend the Campaign for College Opportunity event that is taking place on September 23rd. And with that, um, I'm going to transition to Dr. Bush to offer the closing, but I know knowing him is gonna be more of a benediction. And so um, thank you all and um, go for it, Dr. Bush. Well, there's a close and our benediction is gonna be brief as I know we up against uh, the time. One, one of my favorite movies when I was coming of age was School Days. And there's several iconic scenes in that movie. But I think the most iconic scene in school days is really the last scene. And it was the character of Dak, who was played by a young Lawrence Fishburne. And he wakes up in the, in the morning and feeling the weight of all the different issues that have transpired um, that really has, was problematic. He, he woke up in the morning and he went to the middle of the quad. And in the middle of the quad at this particular institution, um, like many college campuses, it was this huge bell. And so he gets up early in the morning and he begins to just shake the bell, alarming everyone that was asleep on campus from the president's office to the other administrator, to the president's home, to all the students who were living on campus in the dorm, all came out because they heard the alarm that was responding to the bell. And so what we're asking you to do is to respond to the alarm. Dap, our Lawrence Fishborn, was literally trying to shake the consciousness of people at his institution. He was trying to shake them out of the status quo. He was trying to shake them out of their comfort zone. He was trying to shake them out of the things in which they were accustomed to doing because there was a problem at hand that needed to be addressed. Today, the bell is ringing, the alarm is sounding. And the question is where are our black students? But the larger question is this, what are we willing to do about it? What are we willing to upset? What are we willing to change? Are we willing to challenge our own level of comfort to do something different, to respond to the bell that has been ringing? So I leave you the same way that Dap left us in school days. Wake up! Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Bush. That was that was wonderful. Um, thank you all who attended. We will be sharing uh, the recording, the complete recording of today's webinar, as well as the slide deck for those of you who are registered. And uh, we wanna wish everyone a very successful fall term and uh, stay safe and stay healthy um, and mask up. Thank you so much.